page 910. So if you've got one of these, if you've not got a Bible with you, there's some on the side as well. Um, but we, yes, we're finishing up. We've spent about six weeks now going quite quickly through the book of Hosea, partially because I think if we went verse by verse, it'd be, it'd be a tough read. Uh, so we, we went quite quickly through it. Um, and perhaps we've been through some difficult weeks thinking about discipline and what God says to us, and <coughs> character and punishment and, and hard things to think about and to talk about. But actually, at its heart, Hosea is a love story. Maybe that's hard to imagine in the context of what we've talked about over the last few weeks, but Hosea is authentically a love story. Maybe not like the you know, romantic comedies that you might watch at the cinema, uh, not like the conditional love that we have for people, I love you as long as, you know, fill in the blank. Um, it's a love story, God's love story, a love that is redemptive, that God rescues and restores us, and a love that, quite honestly, is uh, somewhat unrequited, not always returned. That was true in Hosea's time, and that's true in our time, isn't it, as well? That God offers a love to people that is not always returned. But Hosea is, in fact, a love story. I'll remind you, just so we can think about where we've come before we finish up today. Uh, the, Hosea actually begins, those first two chapters, telling us the story of Hosea himself, his own personal experience, how God wanted to speak to the nation of Israel through his life, through his relationships. And so we see Hosea, perhaps he fell in love, we don't know, but perhaps he fell in love with a woman who was working as a prostitute. And so he went to, to rescue her out of this life. Because a person who would find themselves in that position in one form or fashion is probably trapped. They're trapped perhaps by, perhaps she was trapped by addiction, perhaps she was trapped by another person who kept her there, or maybe she was trapped by her own choice, that it, it was an easy way to make money, perhaps. You know, it was a way to support herself. We don't know why she ended up, but she was trapped and she needed to be rescued. And so Hosea went and rescued Gomer out of a life of prostitution, and he said, I will love you, and I will care for you, and I'll make you my wife. And so they were married, and they had a child together, and perhaps things were good for a time. And then what we know is that she had an affair. She became pregnant outside of the marriage. And Hosea said, it's okay. I still love you. I'll forgive you, and I will raise your child as if it's my own. And so they continued on for a time. And then again, a second time, she found herself uh, 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 having a relationship outside of her marriage. She became pregnant a second time, and a second time, Hosea said, and it's hard to imagine for us, isn't it? A second time, Hosea said, it's okay, you're my wife, and I love you, and I forgive you, and I will take care of this child as if it's my own. And then, inexplicably, uh, his wife, Gomer, decides to leave the marriage, to run away from home, and to go back to her life of prostitution. And it's hard to imagine. We don't really hear much about Gomer, do we? About what she's thinking or feeling. Was she feeling ashamed? Did she think she didn't deserve to be loved like that? Did she think that there's no way that that could have, life could have been real? Perhaps her, her previous life before her marriage meant that for her, love was always transactional. And she just couldn't imagine the kind of love that Hosea had to offer. We don't know a lot about Gomer, but actually it's helpful to think about because in that story, it's the people of Israel and us who were meant to be like Gomer, those people who run away from this beautiful love. And you think, well, who would run away from that? But I can look around my life and think, who would run away from a God who would give his life for you? But people run away, don't they? And she went back to her life of prostitution. And for many of us, thinking about that kind of a marriage relationship, if you had loved someone, rescued them out of this terrible life and said, no matter what you've done before, I'm going to love you and make you my partner, my spouse, I'm going to live with you. If you had children together, you'd forgiven infidelity again and again, and the person ran away, you might just say, look, we'd, you'd forgive them, wouldn't you, for saying, I've done, I've done my best. I've tried to love this person. Now Jose is a single father with three children, two of whom he didn't, parent, he didn't father himself. You could understand from a human point of view, him saying, I've done all that I can, I'm just going to leave her to it. That's the life she chose, I'm just going to let her live it. In a human perspective, 
we would we would understand that maybe even excuse it as well what else can a person do but that's not what Hosea does it says a second time Hosea went back and again she's trapped we don't know what circumstances trap her in that life but he says he buys her freedom he buys her freedom to rescue her again and so we're told this story about Hosea's love for his wife and his pursuit of his wife so that we can understand God's love for us and so that the nation of Israel could understand God's love for them. That God rescues us when we're in a messy place, when we're in the midst of our sin, a sin that traps us, perhaps trapped by our own addictions and compulsions into a sinful lifestyle, perhaps trapped because of other people's experiences, other people who've pushed us from God, other people who've made us believe things about faith that have pushed us so far away and they've kept us in a sinful lifestyle, or perhaps trapped by our own choices, that we've just decided I don't need God and I'm perfectly fine this way, thank you very much. Whatever it is that traps us, and yet we're told that God came to rescue us, right? The nation of Israel, God came to rescue them, to bring them into freedom. He rescued them out of Egypt, right? Just like he rescues us through Jesus out of our sinfulness. And God says to us again and again and again, I forgive you. Every time we make a mistake, every time we break his heart, he says, it's okay. I still love you. I do forgive you. I understand you've got this whole history and it's a difficult thing to leave behind your past life. And so I take you as you are. And even when you bring things into the relationship that should have never been there, I will, I will, you know, like those children, I'll just accept you as you are and I will love you as you are. And yet still, what happened in Hosea and perhaps what happens in us sometimes is yet still people who've loved, been loved like that, they still run away sometimes. They still go back to old habits. And again, what are, the, what are the reasons why? Why would someone run away? Well, perhaps it's our own addictions or compulsions. Perhaps it's the experiences of people. I've met many church people over the years who had something horrible happen in the church. And they say, I just can't have anything to do with God. Because sometimes it's people who push us away, right? Someone else who pushes us away from God. And sometimes it's just quite simply our own choice. We say, actually, it's not for me. I don't need God. I have a different set of uh, things that are important. And so we run away like Gomer, back to a life that we said we were leaving behind. And this is where we pick up at the end of Hosea. That all throughout Hosea, God is telling this story to the nation of Israel. And actually, when we, when we root it in the context of this relationship, all that anger and frustration and hurt and pain that we hear God expressing, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If your partner that, you, that you've given your life to, committed in relationship to, cheated on you a time and time and time again, and then ran back to prostitution, threw all of your love back in your face, you would feel angry, wouldn't you? In fact, you might be tempted to say, you know what you really deserve? You might want to, you might want to say, this is what you deserve. You deserve whatever bad things happen to you. You deserve it because hurt and anger. And so we see this in God, that justice says, look, what you deserve is. And yet what we see over and over again in Hosea is God, a bit like we do at times, wrestling with emotion of what it means to truly love redemptively, unconditionally without expectation, a God who loves and says, I'm still going to forgive you. I'm still gonna come back for you time and time and time again. But this is the picture we have in Hosea. So we understand the anger, and yet God says, I don't want it to be that way. God says that there is actually a solution there could be a resolution. And so today, we aren't going to read them all, you'll be happy to know, but we're finishing with chapters 12 to 14. And chapters 12 and 13 is more of that God sort of saying, well, this is what you deserve, and this is what you should experience, and this is what should happen to you. And then in chapter 14, we land at, so what's the solution? After all of this, how could this relationship be restored? Is there a way out? And God says there is a way out. Israel can have a relationship with God again. We can have a relationship with God again. And so what I want to look at for just a moment is what is the solution? What's the way that God says we can come back to him? So we're going to read all of uh, Hosea chapter 14. 
Uh, so beginning in verse 1, Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. And this is what God says. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. For in you, the fatherless find compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Like the cedar of Lebanon, he will send down its roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree, his fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell again in his shade. They will flourish like the corn. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am like a flourishing juniper. Your fruitfulness comes from me. Who is wise? Let them realize these things. Who is discerning? Let them understand. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. So it actually ends on this sort of hopeful note that the book of Hosea ends with this sort of invitation from God that says, we can make this relationship right again, and here's how. And he tells us two things. There's two things we can do to repair and restore the relationship that gets broken. The first thing we find in verse 2, he says, take words with you. It's, it's a strange sentiment, isn't it? What does that mean? Take words with you. What God is saying here is, it's not enough, right? In ancient Israel, they had the temple, and actually most religions of that time, they would have had a space where they sacrificed animals. That's how they worshipped in that time. And so the Jews were no different. They had a temple, and when they sinned, they would go to the temple, and they would go through their rituals, and they would cleanse, and they would sacrifice animals, and they'd say certain prayers and do certain things. And God says, I don't want you just to come back into the relationship as if nothing has happened and just start doing the same things you always did again. You need to bring some words with you. Say something. You need to say you're sorry. You need to admit that something went wrong. We, it makes sense, doesn't it? If you have a falling out with your partner or, or your, one of your kids or a friend, and sometimes, what is the tendency? I, there's probably not a person in this room who hasn't had a moment where you've had a falling out and you have that moment, you feel a bit queasy because you know you're going to see that person after you've had an argument, and you have the temptation. What do you do? Do you just pretend like nothing happened? Do you just, oh, hi, and you know that the last time you saw them was not pleasant, right? You, you had a bit of a tiff. Maybe a, a sarcastic comment, you know, you let it pass. Maybe you have a little argument in the morning over coffee, and then when the partner comes home from work in the evening, you think, right, are we going to have it out, or are we going to pretend like that comment never was said? And sometimes, for, for however long, God says, in the relationship, I've just let it go. I've just said, it's fine. We don't need to get into it. We'll just pretend like it didn't happen, but God says it's not enough anymore, right? All relationships come to a point. There has to be communication. You can't just pretend like things don't happen, or eventually there's a big brick wall, and you know, you're know you calling solicitors, aren't you? It doesn't work that way. God says you can't just pretend like nothing has gone on, so you need to bring some words. You need to come back and say, I'm sorry. Just admit that something has gone wrong between us. Just say it out loud. And God says, well, forgive. Just need to bring some words with you. So God says, it's not enough to just come back to church and show up and start, you know, singing the songs and listening to the sermons and going through the motions like you used to do. It's not enough to go to a Bible study. It's not enough to just do those things and pretend like you were never distant from God, like nothing ever happened. God said, you need to bring some words with you. When you come to the church, when you come to that space of worship, make sure you bring, along with your worship, along with your prayers, along with anything else, bring an I'm sorry. Makes sense, doesn't it? We want the same. Bring an I'm sorry. The second thing that God says in verse 3 
Uh, he talks about Assyria and war horses, and he talks about our own gods. What he says there, uh, take words with you, and then the second one is put down your idols. Put down your idols. In other words, stop trying to live your life independent of God. You see, the nation of Israel, when it talks about uh, the war horses and the Assyrians, what the nation of Israel was doing was attempting to find power and safety and security in another more powerful nation. Well, this empire, the Assyrian Empire and the Assyrian king, they'll protect us and they'll be the ones. And God is saying they were never the ones who were going to provide you safety and security. It was always supposed to be me. And they were, uh, it talks about their own gods. Well, in chapters 12 and 13, we didn't read them, but if you went back through, there's spaces in here where it talks about um, uh, they had dishonest scales, that they were running a business and trying to build wealth. That's chapter 12. In chapter 13, it talks about the king of Assyria. That what basically happens is, what an idol is, is anything that seeks to take the place of God. Not that you might not believe in God, but that it becomes more important than God. So we trust in money to, to, to take care of us or look after us. We trust in power or influence or our good name. And the nation of Israel was saying, there's things that we can do for ourselves to secure our future, to make sure that our future is secure, that our present is filled with the good things of life, and, you know, that money can buy, essentially. Right? Pursuing these things and saying, what, wherever God fits in the mix, he's just one of a few things in the mix. But actually, the thing that I'm pursuing, and what happens with people, so I call this the, uh, you're not the boss of me syndrome. When I was a teenager, when I was 16, I used to babysit all the time. I'm the oldest of 14 grandchildren, uh, by a lot. Like, I'm, I'm 43, and my next oldest cousin is uh, 30, I think. Like, so, and then they're all quite a bit younger after that. So I did lots of babysitting. And uh, I can remember, as well as uh, in the church that I grew up in, I grew up in a church that like Beacon, and I was like the oldest teenager, so I was always the phone call when the parents in the church went to go out for dinner or something. And I did lots of babysitting, and there's always a moment when you go to put the kids to bed, and they were not ready to go to bed, and you're not their mom, and I often got the, you're not the boss of me, you can't tell me what to do, you're not my mom. You know, and you're 16 or 17, you don't look that impressive, let's be honest, and you're trying to like, I am the boss of you, you know, but you're still a kid yourself, right? But I think, actually, within all of us lives this toddler that screams out at God, you're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. You don't get to decide my choices. You don't get to decide what I do with my time or my money or how I run my family or how I choose to live my life. If I choose to include God as a piece of the puzzle, that's my choice, but I am the ruler of my life. And that's what it means to create idols, to create things that say, I want to be independent from God. I don't want to need God. He might be a nice extra, he might be a nice thing on the side because I want to be a good citizen and a moral person. But God's not satisfied with that. And so God says, when you come, if you want to restore this relationship, you need to bring some words. You need to say you're sorry. And you've got to stop doing what you were doing, right? It's not really an I'm sorry. How many of you will say it's not really an I'm sorry if someone says, oh, honey, I'm sorry that I never put the cap back on the toothpaste but then they continue to not put the cap back on the toothpaste. They're not really sorry, are they? They're sorry that you got mad about it, maybe. They're sorry that you're bothered. They're sorry. Some of you are like, yes, that toothpaste. Sorry, I didn't mean to open old wounds, right? But uh, like, see what, we do this all the time with much more serious things, right? We say we're sorry, but then the behavior continues. And if you're the injured party, what do you think? Well, they're not really sorry, because if you were sorry, you wouldn't keep doing it because you would know that it hurt me or it upset me, and so you try to do something different. And you might fail, and you might make a mistake, but at least you try. And that's what God says to us. This relationship can be restored. There is a way out. But you need to say you're sorry, take words, and you need to put down your idols. You need to start living in a different way. Stop trying to be independent of God. Now the irony about this chapter that's verses 2 and 3. And then verses 4 to 7, 
And you might remember when we read it, if you look there at the passage, it talks about them blossoming, blossoming like a lily, um, that they're like a cedar in Lebanon, that, there's, that they have a splendor, that people will dwell in their shade, that there's flourishing and putting down roots. All these are images. Uh, cedars and olive trees would be an image of wealth. Uh, that they're spreading and people are taking shade under their wings means that they're powerful, that they're strong, that people can come to rest on them. That the irony is that God said, I always intended good things. All the things they were trying to gather, wealth and security and a good name, God always wanted those things for them. They were trying to get it for themselves. And God said, you created such a mess you've mucked it all up because you've tried to do it yourself and the irony is i always wanted good things for you it reminds me i'm going to tell on myself this morning i told i talked to my mom late last night and i told her she would tell this story and she just laughed at me uh so i don't i think maybe it's a big deal here but i don't know if it's quite the same so in america turning 16 is a big deal, especially for a girl, but for everyone. Sweet 16, the 16th birthday is a big deal. Now, some of you will not be surprised to discover that as a kid growing up, I always planned my own birthday parties. I, I organized them and just let my mom know what we'd be doing <laughs> and, uh, you know, what, where we'd be at. So I always did the planning, but when it came to my 16th birthday, they wouldn't let me plan anything. As a, you know, early days of my control nature, I found that very uncomfortable. I can't plan my own birthday, but I felt confident, you know, a few weeks out that my parents are nice parents and that they were, in fact, planning something special. And as the days got closer, and I grew up, we went to church every Sunday, and I never, no matter when your birthday fell, if it fell on a Sunday, which my 16th did, you wouldn't have your party on a Sunday because we did church. So I knew my birthday would be on a Friday or a Saturday. That's when we'd have the party. And so the weekend's coming around. I've not heard anything. I've not seen any preparation. I'm getting a bit anxious now. You know, come on, Mom, don't let me down. Don't let me down. This is the big one. I'm turning 16, you know, when you're that age. The world revolves around you, doesn't it? Uh, and so Friday comes, Saturday comes. Well, by Sunday morning, I'm like, I'm fuming. Like, I'm 16 and literally nothing has happened. I have not had a party and I wake up and my mom gave me a card, which I'm sure I was incredibly ungrateful for because I thought, is this, is this what we're doing? And then they said, well, you know, get ready for church. And I'm like, we're going to church still? It's my birthday. What about my party? And, you know, my parents are quite strict, you know, they're just get ready for church, right? So I get myself ready and hump, you know, only as a teenager can do, full of um, angst and grumpiness. And it was really a joy to be around that day, I'm sure. <laughs> but went to church, did the whole thing, came through. And by the time we got home, I just remember sitting upstairs. I can still see my parents, you know, the old couches that we had. And my brother and I, he's 14 and oblivious or just happy to see me in a bad mood and, you know, probably antagonizing me a bit more. And we're sitting in the living room and I'm just like, oh, and I just like hate the world. I have the worst parents ever. I was supposed to have a birthday. 16 was supposed to be momentous. I've planned better birthday parties for myself. And all I got was a card. I mean, ungrateful, really a jerk. Like I just wasn't being nice. And to be honest with you, if it wasn't for the fact it was my birthday, I probably would have been in trouble because I would not have been allowed to act that way towards my parents normally. I don't know why they tolerated it. But it was just unpleasant. And then there was a knock at the door. My mom said, you know, Chrissy, the door's for you. And I said, I'm not getting the door. <laughs> I'm like, taking my life on my hands with that. Uh, and I just remember my mom, Christina Lynn, get down there and answer that door. You know, and the whole name comes out, you're in big trouble. Yeah, go downstairs. And I'm like, oh, you know, and I'm like, oh. And I open, open the door and it's a stranger. And I'm about to shout out, like, I don't even know who it is. Which is horribly rude. But I didn't, because a moment later, what I saw out in the parking lot, just at the curb in front of the house, is a long, white, limousine. And the person at the door was a chauffeur. And in fact, he had a whole bunch of balloons in his hand saying, happy birthday. And he said, are you Chrissy? I said, oh, yes. You know, and my brother's come tumbling down. He wants to see who it is. And I'm like, mom. And I turn around, and she's at the top of the stairs. And it's this moment that should have been full of joy. But what did I feel? I felt a bit excited. I felt a bit like there's a limo. Literally never been in a limo since, so it really was a momentous moment, right? But also, I felt a bit ashamed and a bit embarrassed and I felt a bit sad. 
I thought, well, I've been, I've been a real jerk. So I ran back upstairs, like, what, what do I do? Like, this is still a strange man, do I get in his car? Or like, what do I do, you know? And gave them a hug, probably muttered a quick, I'm sorry. And my mom said, right, right, go down, you know, and of course, take your brother with you, because there was nothing I could do as a teenager that didn't require take your brother with you. Uh, so my brother and I climb into the back of this limo, and it's stocked to the hill with Coke and Sprite and Fanta and fancy glasses. And so I remember my brother and I each filling up a Coke and chinking our glasses, feeling very special, you know. And of course, I'm still a bit of a jerk, because as, as we're riding down the road, I'm thinking, it would have been a bit more fun if my friends were here. <laughs> like... What is wrong with this kid? Well, we pull into the parking lot of my high school, and there's a group of my friends waiting for me at my school. And so they all pile in, and then we go over to a restaurant called the Olive Garden, which is, uh, I didn't even know, it's, it's, it's nice, but you know, you take your kids there. <laughs> it's not that nice. And so we go in, and we have this really nice lunch, and have a really wonderful time, and presents and gifts. Now, we ride home in my parents' van because the limo was just a one-way trip. It's a birthday on a budget, after all. But I remember this whole experience, and I tell you this because for weeks and that whole entire day, I was grumpy and frustrated and not very nice because I, I assumed, I expected certain things to happen and my parents didn't do it the way I wanted and I really wanted to do it myself. I wanted to plan my own birthday, I wanted to be in charge of myself and when it didn't go the way I wanted, I just thought my parents have let me down, they've not done what I wanted and yet the fact of the matter was, they always had a good plan for me. They always had a good intention. They always wanted something good for me because no parent, you know, on the day your child is born thinks, oh, if you're, you know, good parents, and they're not like all parents are good parents, but no good, loving parent holds their baby and thinks, I can't wait till I get to discipline this child. I can't wait till I have the day when I can send them to their room for being disrespectful. Like, nobody, no parent wants that. You're filled with hopes and dreams. You want good things for your children, and you want it when they're six months old and when they're 60 years old. You're always wanting, and you can't choose for them. You can't decide for them. That's the painful bit, isn't it? When they start getting to be, you know, in their 20s and 30s and 40s, and maybe if you're lucky, they come to you for advice. But so all you can do is give advice, offer a steer, encourage them, hope you've given them enough, and then you watch them make choices. And you hope they make good choices and you want them to have a good future and you want them to experience good things because that's what you've always wanted for them. And in Hosea, God talks about, uh, when Lawrence preached uh, last week, he talks about, there was a, I think it might have been chapter 11, where God refers to himself as a father. Like a good father who always had good plans. And that's what God says uh, here at the end of Hosea chapter 14. The irony for the nation of Israel and for us is we work so hard to do it ourselves. I'm going to get for myself the life that I want. And God says, I always had a good plan for you. I just wanted you to walk in a healthy relationship with me. And the only thing you ever had to do to restore it was just to come back, bring some words, and say you're sorry, and try your best. You don't even have to be perfect. God's proved that. I'll forgive you every time, but try your best to live a different way. Allow me to rescue you and forgive you of your sin, and you follow me. That's all God ever wanted. Now here's the sad thing. Hosea ends at chapter 14, and God makes this beautiful offer. Bring your words, give up your idols, everything will be okay. And as far as we know, the nation of Israel, they never took them up on that offer. God's love in that sense was unrequited. It wouldn't be until Jesus came that anything would change. It's a bit of a sad love story, isn't it? And the fact of the matter is it's true for, for, for people like us as well. That for some of us, we've never allowed Jesus to rescue us, right? We've never accepted that first moment of saying, yes, I know I'm a sinner and I want Jesus to, sit, to rescue me, to be my Lord and my Savior. And some of us have accepted Jesus, but we've fallen to the wayside, we've walked away a little bit, and God's saying, just come back, just come back. And in either circumstance, whether it's the first rescue or maybe one further down the line, there will be some of us and people who aren't here today who God's made the offer, just come back. 
and he'll just be left standing at the altar. Some people won't come. They just won't. Some of us will have spaces in our hearts that we won't give back to God, even though he says, just come. And the saddest bit of all, it just takes a word. Good parents are like that, aren't they? As angry as you can be, as frustrating as your kids can be. Oh, why are they like this? But if they come back, even if it's a horrible apology, if they make an attempt at an apology, it just all melts away, doesn't it? And you're like, oh, it's never mad. It's okay, just come here. You just hold yourself so cute, you know. And we just love them again, don't we? It only takes a word.